Hello and welcome to part 5 of my dividing head series. In this video I will be making the plunger assembly required for direct indexing. The project has been designed to have a number of holes drilled into this worm gear here that can be indexed directly using a plunger mounted my bracket hanging off the banjo arm there. This will allow a number of often used and simple divisions to be machined easily and reasonably accurately without recourse to the indexing plates. I will start with the bracket, which is a very simple component, over at the mill. The bracket requires two holes, one is to be 3 8 reamed and the other threaded half inch 26. As I will be threading on the lathe, I will drill and ream them both 3 8 to establish their positions and then wait to enlarge the one to be threaded on the lathe itself. Reaming both gives me a nice surface to pick up later with the indicator. These holes are centred on width and I have left excess material at each end for rounding. I am radiusing the ends on the rotary table but it isn't necessary to do so. These are cosmetic features only and they could just as easily be added with a file or sander if needed. That's one end complete. I will finish the other end off camera and that will be this part complete for now. Well, we are back at the bench earlier than planned, as I couldn't resist just adding this bracket to the project so far with a pin to see how it looks. And I've noticed a problem. The centre of the hole does not drop down far enough to reach the specified PCD for the holes that will be drilled in the gear. This is entirely my fault. The plans call for this part to be tapered, but I didn't bother. In the book, Thomas suggests that you could leave the part parallel if you wanted. Now, I'm not going to say George Thomas was wrong, but my part is going to need to be tapered, just to allow it to drop the 20 thou or so it needs to reach that PCD. So back to the mill to get that done. I do like doing work twice. So here we are set up to add that taper. Those playing along at home will notice I have moved house, and while that was stressful, it has given me the opportunity to make the poor lighting a little bit worse. I'm supporting the bracket on the vice jaws using two pieces of 3 8 round stock and then lifting the one end with some feeler gauges. The plans call for the radius on the small end to be 1 32nd below the large. It is probably best to do as we're told this time, so I will aim for that. I have scribed on the edges where I want the taper to run out and I will just mill down to that line on both sides. There it is tapered, I do need to blend in the radius which I'll do off camera and we can move on to the next part. Next up is the plunger pin itself. The material is supplied as 5 16th silver steel with the factory diameter being a working dimension for the part. As the concentricity of all the features on this pin are reasonably critical, I have taken the time to dial this into the fore jaw as close as I can and it is certainly within half a thou of true. The first operation is to machine the 5 30 seconds pin that will register the holes in the gear. I'm removing the bulk of the material with a carbide tool before switching to a high speed steel form tool to take the final passes and add the quarter inch radius. On this machine the most successful approach to form tools is very low speed, plenty of cutting oil and a high feed pressure. As soon as I lift off the feed the work will begin to chatter. The mating holes in the gear are to be drilled but not reamed, so using the same drill bit I've produced a sample hole in some scrap which I'm using as a gauge. With the pin to size, the part is face to length and chamfered before spinning around in the chuck to machine the shaft. Again this is dialed in true, at least to the extent of my measuring equipment. I have a carriage stop position to set the length of the 5 16th portion in the chuck and I'm supporting it with a half centre in the tailstock. This is a straightforward piece of parallel turning, again with the proviso of tailstock adjustment as we go along to ensure parallelism. Aside from cutting to length, this part is now complete, so it's on to the main body. This part is machined from 3 quarter inch round and is to be bored for the pin and threaded externally to mount onto the bracket. I'm going to machine all of the features in this one setup, so I will add some support from the tailstock. Most of the dimensions on this part will be marked out using odd leg calipers and I will then turn to the line by eye. The first feature is the half inch dimension for the thread and as always I am using a carriage stop to set the position of the shoulder. 
Next up is the undercut for that thread to run into, followed by the thread itself. The plan's calling for 26 TPI, but as I don't have any suitable pitch half inch taps, and I'm going to have to screw cut the internal thread anyway, I'm going to thread mine 32, as it's a multiple of eight. A quick cleanup with a brush and file completes the thread. Next up is some relief at the final body length to allow me to back turn the main body diameter. As with the plunger pin, I am roughing this close to size with a carbide tool. And then finishing with a high speed form tool to bring to dimension and machine the radius. That is all of the external features complete, so it's on to the boring. The hole is opened out to 1 64th below 5 16th, with the depth simply set by a sharpie mark on the drill. The hole is then reamed 5 16th to take that unmachined portion of the plunger. With that done, I am now using a long centre drill here to carefully spot the bottom of the hole before drilling and reaming the guide for the plunger shaft at 5 30 seconds. The body can then finally be parted off to length. The last part of this plunger assembly is the knurled knob, which is from the same three-quarter stock. After I have lightly clamped the knurling tool onto the work, I back it out and add about one-eighth of a turn. Using plenty of cutting oil, I can wind the tool back onto the work centre line and inspect the result. I continue this process, adding more cut each time until the tool produces a result I'm happy with. I find the knurl tends to get worse before eventually coming together with one final adjustment of the tool. Once I'm happy with the result, the tool is fed back into the centre line and traversed down the part under power feed. I like to complete any knurling oversize and then turn down to final dimension. I'm pretty happy with that, so I can form the external profile. Same procedure here as before. Most of the material is removed with an insert and then it's finished with the form tool. Personally, I like a small plane section either side of a knurl, and adding those with a left and right insert gives a nice taper to that transition. The part is then faced the length and given a light polish with some wet and dry. I can then add the short plane section to the left side of the knurl, drill and ream to 5 30 seconds, and finally part off. Next is the threaded hole at the narrow end of the bracket. This is simply clamped directly to the faceplate, as this feature is small enough that the tooling will pass into the spindle without interfering with it. I'm setting the position on the faceplate roughly using a 3 8 drill in the tailstock, and then I'm bringing it in using an indicator and gentle taps with a brass drift. With the part locked down, I can open out the hole to size, initially with a drill and then a boring bar. I'm looking for about 80% thread engagement on this, which for these threads is a bore of 0.469. We are to size, so I can touch off and simply dial into depth. Again, the multiple of 8 pitch means I can ignore the thread dial. That should be the final pass, and the body is a good fit, so I can add a generous chamfer using a countersink to the part, and while this is set up and running true, I'm going to use this as a fixture to face the parted side of the body. OK, so let's have a look at how all of those components go together. The bracket is now threaded and tapered. I've run a file over all of those milled surfaces, and the body looks good, and I have a nice fit in the bracket as well. It takes a spring, which is supplied in the kit, and then the plunger itself, which is a reasonable fit in both of the bores. And finally, this is all backed up with the knob. I've made this shaft over long as I want to adjust the stroke once I have the holes drilled in the gear. In my mind, it is the curved part of the plunger that should register in the hole, and from what I can tell, the dimensions on the plans don't allow for that, so I'll need to finish this to suit later on. The last things we need to machine today are the cross hole in the knob here to take a grub screw, and the shoulder bolt to mount this bracket to the banjo there. So over to the lathe to make a start on the bolt. This should be a simple piece of turning. The shoulder is 3 8 and the head is dimensioned at 23 30 seconds. But regardless, it needs to be a close fit in the jig that will be used for drilling the hole for the location pin. Reducing the diameter to 3 8 from 3 quarters requires a reasonable amount of material removal. 
So I've set up a carriage stop and I'm taking 60,000 from diameter per pass. Now there was clearly something going on here, but at the time I couldn't immediately see what it was. The carriage was not hitting the stop before reaching the shoulder on the work. I initially thought that a build-up of swarf between the carriage and the stop was pushing it along the bed. I did eventually notice, and in the video you can clearly see it is the work that is being pulled from the chuck. On the lathe I almost exclusively use high rake polished inserts that are really designed for aluminium. On my machinery the finish they give on almost all materials is always better than I need. However, the nose radius, high rake and overall geometry really make them unsuitable for heavy cuts. I would usually switch out to a high speed tool, but I didn't have one set up in a holder and I thought I'd save time by not bothering. There's probably a lesson there somewhere. With the work reset and now lighter cuts being taken, normal service is resumed. The part is taken to dimension with the head of the bolt being made a good fit in the jig. Another mixing of measurement systems calls for this to be threaded M8, so the section is turned to size and a runoff groove for the thread is machined. For metric threads I tend to screw cut close to size and then finish off with the die. Doing it this way makes starting the die easier and it always seems to give nice results. Facing to length, a chamfer and a quick clean up with some emery completes the threads. Here we are at the mill, I parted off the bolt and faced the backside off camera and I've set it up in a v-block here. Locating this hole is as simple as moving the tables until the drill drops freely into the guide. I can then transfer this location to the bolt head and then open out to size. Finally at the mill the knob needs to be drilled and tapped M3 for a retaining grub screw. When cross drilling like this I like to centre drill deeply enough that a small chamfer remains when opening out the hole. In my experience this leaves a surface that needs little or no deburring. Well, that's complete so we can head back to the bench to see how it all looks. The bolt looks okay, I've secured the silver steel pin there with Loctite, I just cut this to length and domed the ends freehand using a file on the lathe. The fit in the banjo is actually very satisfying and while that pin is probably not strictly necessary it does add a certain something. I have set the knob on the plunger to the dimensions on the plans and as I've said I will adjust this length once I have the holes drilled in the gear. The plans also call for a pin inside this joint that can be used as a holdout which I will leave until I've settled on the final sizing. This whole assembly can now be mounted onto the body with a single M8 nut and we are getting close to having a functional dividing head. All in all, this has been a really pleasing set of components to machine and I'm really tempted to put this gear onto the rotary table to drill the hole so it does become functional, but I will restrain myself and wait until I have some of the division plates that will allow the holes to be drilled in situ, as suggested in the book. What I couldn't resist doing is taking a very light facing cut off the sides of the wheel and adding a shallow chamfer to both sides of the teeth, which I think improves the look significantly. Anyway, I think that brings part 5 to a close. Next time I'll be completing the ball handles that will replace the cap screws I have in the spindle and tailstock locks here. So please look out for that if you're interested. Again, do leave any thoughts in the comments. If you do want to see more like this, please do subscribe. And hopefully I'll see you again. Cheerio!